if there was ever an underlining consistent message that I'm preaching to you, the hearers out there, it would be that you need to develop a secret prayer life. You need to develop a secret study time where you increase in grace and the knowledge of him through the study of the word and through private secret prayer. And where did this come from in me? What birthed this in me, the importance of prayer? Well, today I'm telling you a story about this man, David Brainerd. When I was first saved, a pastor introduced me to this man, and I began to read up on him. And I have a book that I am going to revisit, but that I started reading concerning this man's life, and it revolutionized my life. It changed me for good, and I'm not the only one. Men like John Wesley, in fact, John Wesley was so touched by the life of Brainerd, he had a very deep concern that the future ministers in the world, in the pulpit, were going to be needing inspiration like the life of David Brainerd. And men through our recent history like George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, E.M. Bounds, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, and the list goes on right to me. Because I am one of those who have been touched deeply by his life, and I know you will too. If you would read about this man, and you have any heart for prayer, if you have a little heart for prayer and for the reading of God's word, read about this man's life. I can guarantee you, you will be touched in an incredibly new way in the spiritual sense, and it will bless you. And I hope to bless you today by this video. Enjoy. Well, hello, viewers. Thank you for coming back again. Thank you for liking and subscribing and uh, for the comments. I want to thank you, new subscribers also. Uh, it really blesses me. It's no small thing what you're doing to support this ministry. So God bless you and may you encounter God in a fresh new way in Jesus' name. Amen to that. And uh, I would like to thank you for those who, uh, like Brad, who helped me out on uh, on places that I really don't know much about, especially in social media. Uh, thank you for all of the viewers. This last video that I made last time on uh, on William Seymour, uh, you've really blessed my heart. There was almost 400 people who view, viewed that, and and to me, that's certainly more than I deserve. It's uh, it's one message that went out to 400 people. The one before that was 600 people. That's a single message that went to that that many people, and I think that's like giving a message to 600 or 400 people. That is no small thing. It's like preaching to four or 600 people all at once from a pulpit. At least that's how it feels sometimes. So thank you again for your views and for coming back to view other things from me as well. I appreciate that. And again, I say God bless you in Jesus' name. Um, you know, uh, back to David Brainerd, born 1718. When he was nine years old, his very devout, godly, well-saved father passes away. Um, and then five years after that, when he was 14, his, his godly, saintly mother passes away. Both of these people are well-saved, developed a good prayer life. They were incredibly um, very disciplined with David Brainerd. So from David Brainerd's youth and his mother, um, uh, preaching to him and uh, telling him how to live, he he felt it incumbent upon his spirit that he should honor his mother and father in that he should develop the same type of uh, resilient prayer life and reading of the word. Um, he, re he read chapters a day. He was very devout. He was uh, considering the ministry and um, and certainly uh, loving God, uh, like Cornelius was loving God before the Spirit of God actually uh, came upon him at the preaching of Peter in the book of Acts. 
uh, like that, he loved God and he was a devout man and he, he had developed a prayer life member. He was young and up to the age of 21, he was, he was praying four or five hours a day. This man had already developed by the time he was 21 a regimented life of prayer and the reading of God, God's word. Now, lest ye think that this is the way of salvation, David Brainerd came to a point when he was 21 years old in, uh, in 1739 where he realized that he wasn't saved at all. And uh, he, he met God when he was walking one summer night and, uh, and he said that it was unspeakable glory that he, he had an encounter with God. And uh, he, he saw his soul and the, the devastating reality was that he actually didn't know Christ. He was, he was a devout man of prayer. He read the word of God every day. It was a works-based religion based on the faith of his parents. And yet he wasn't saved. And he, he recognized that he wasn't saved. He invited Christ in. Christ changed his life and then uh, translated him into the kingdom of God and where he began to pray in a, in a, and as a new creature, he said the world was new uh, to him. It was like he was living in a new world, in a new body, as a new creature. And the Bible tells us that is exactly true, doesn't it? And David Brainerd, Brainerd was living uh, now the new transformed life. So he decides to go to Yale. And in uh, later that year, so it was in July of 18, uh, 1739, that he was gave his life to Christ truly. And he was uh, set on fire by the Spirit of God. And he had that uh, wonderful spiritual experience I tell you about other men have had. And I, uh, a few of us have had because none of us are really... Uh, often seeking God that much for for uh, just an encounter with him. Um, but it happened to David Brainerd. So David Brainerd later on that year in September goes to school in Yale and he was discouraged by the deadness of the students, by the hazing, by the ungodliness and by the teachers who were who were so cold and unspiritual. And he was discouraged. And not only was he discouraged, but he developed the measles and he had to go home for several weeks in the midst. Now, remember, he struggled terribly with depression most of his life, even in his Christian life. He struggled with depression, but not only him, there was about a 200 year history in uh, 1865. Just on a side note, he, uh, a descendant of his named Thomas Brainerd said that there was a long time struggle, a spirit of depression, um, and and uh, it died with David Brainerd. So he was often, you know, when you're somebody who breaks a family history or a family curse, um, David Brainerd was that guy. If you're the person breaking that curse, sometimes you're the last person that suffers terribly with it. And it was this case with David Brainerd. Uh, but that's a, that's another story for another time. He went home for several weeks and get this. This is where the holy intersection of people's lives blow me away. Um, he comes back after several weeks to Yale in, uh, 17, uh, 39 in November, he comes back after being sick from the measles and, uh, uh, it's, the school is on fire and there was a, there, it's on fire with revival because John, uh, sorry, George Whitfield was there and while Brainerd was at home recovering, George Whitfield set the entire campus on fire because remember, this was in the midst of the great, the first great awakening. And so, uh, it had come into the college and there was a battle going on between the old lights who resisted the revival and the new lights like, uh, John Wesley and, uh, George Whitfield, uh, uh, you know, and, um, Jonathan Edwards was now, uh, getting ready to preach the, the great sinners in the hands of the angry God in, uh, in 41. In fact, it got so bad that the faculty called in Jonathan Edwards. Again, this is amazing intersection. 
John Wesley was there, George Whitfield, David Brainerd, going to the same school, knowing these men. And uh, Jonathan Edwards was called in to preach to the students about their rebellious attitudes and they weren't rebellious. They were just disagreeing with the unspiritual faculty. Now enter in Jonathan Edwards, who gave another famous message called The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God. And this message was very famous uh, because of the results it had in Yale. Not only Yale, but around all collegiates uh, and, the fact, and to the chagrin of the faculty, they did not appreciate the message that, uh, that Jonathan Edwards gave because all the, the support went to the new lights and the old lights were upset that Jonathan Edwards didn't support them. But in fact, he rebuked them uh, in a matter of speaking throughout the message and the claim that this was a legitimate spiritual awakening and a revival and that he had given his himself his own support to it. Again, that's a famous message you could look up yourself and you could imagine this would have had quite an impact on the students. One of those being, of course, David Brainerd, who developed a wonderful f relationship friendship with Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards couldn't say enough good things about him. His ability to study, his high quality of education and person, and uh, spoke very highly of him. In fact, not to kill any of the story, David Brainerd died in the house of Jonathan Edwards. Some say Jonathan Edwards felt somewhat responsible uh, because what set him on the path to Native America was that that he got kicked out of Yale shortly after Jonathan Edwards' address because he was he was overheard by a teacher speaking negatively about uh, some of the faculty and their unspiritual uh, lives. Uh, they professed Christ, but they were absolutely denying of the spirit. They had they were they had grown so cold these old lights and so he was overheard he was basically booted out of Yale and uh and he went into a, a terrible depression. Now he did in uh in in 42 get the the uh the license to preach and he found himself on a ship going to preach to the savage native americans. Now these the Native Americans at that time, the natives, uh, they hated the white man because they had introduced fire water, which was alcohol, and uh, it was killing people and causing them to kill each other. And so every chance they got, if they could kill a white man, they would. And so David Brainerd's, Brainerd's entering into a savage land, and they want him dead. And uh, he's bringing the gospel because God has told him to, and because Christ has put an anointing on him to preach the gospel. Now, David Brainerd gets there, and uh, here's some, there is some amazing stories about this guy. Uh, sometimes he would spend, he was literally a walking prayer life. This man and the supernatural things that were, that were uh, accompanying him, the signs and wonders, uh, you've got to read about them. There is no end to his short life and the miracles that have happened in his life. Here's one of them. Uh, you know, David Brainerd, uh, was, was, uh, come to this one, one place where the snakes were incredibly bad. And, uh, there was a native tribe who had, had saw him come up, come on to shore and in this area. And they had, uh, discussed in, uh, now this is testimony they had given afterwards. They had said they saw this white man by himself. And he had set up a tent and they had planned that they were going to kill him. So uh, what they did was they were hiding. Now, now remember, David Brainerd had no idea that they were stalking him and watching him for more than a day. Uh, but uh, they, they had decided to kill him until they witnessed him going into his tent, leaving it open and uh, praying. They weren't sure what he was doing, but he was on his knees for hours. And then uh, as they were, they were going to uh, close in on him, they noticed a big snake. And some reports say many snakes, but I'll stick with the one that is most well known. And that is a singular 
great big rattlesnake. It had actually crawled over his legs and he didn't move from prayer. He had stayed in prayer, beseeching God as though the serpent wasn't even there. The serpent, according to these natives, circled around him and then went and arched like it was going to bite his neck. And then as, as quick as it came, it had fled. And uh, all snakes had fled from the area, all serpents, because David Brainerd was in prayer. Isn't that amazing? And these natives knew there was something special about this man. And, uh, and he began to preach to them. For two years, he was unfruitful among the Native Americans. Uh, but then all of a sudden, God anointed him with the Spirit of God, with his spirit, to to preach in a more powerful way. And whenever David Brainerd opened his mouth, mouth to preach, even with drunken interpreters, the Spirit of God would fall upon the natives and they were in agony. They were begging in their own language, oh God, have mercy on us. And David Brainerd said, uh, you know, if he had any doubts that salvation was the work of God through the Holy Spirit, seeing what he saw, changed his mind forever. He said he saw the Spirit of God coming upon these savages and saving them and reforming and renewing and uh, reviving them and saving their souls. There was a work of God like in the day of Pentecost. And in the midst of being depressed and feeling God was far away from him, you know, somebody once told me, if you feel that God is really far away from you, it's probably because he's quite close to you. And I don't know why it is that the righteous feel so unrighteous and the wicked feel so righteous. It's a strange reversal there, but often the nearer you are to God, the more likely you will be to suffer depression and bouts of severe spiritual attack, like David Brainerd and all of these men of God that I tell you about. It's not uncommon that they should suffer. It is one of the unfortunate realities of drawing near to God often, yet there are seasons of unspeakable joy. Now, I've got a, a little excerpt I want you to listen to. It's a bit of an audio from another YouTube uh, audio uh, video. And I just thought, you know, I, I could read you part of his diary from his book, or I could, I could have you listen to somebody else who's a much better reader than me uh, read it. And so if you don't mind, just listen to a little excerpt from his his uh, diary so that you can get a good understanding of the heart of this man and the spiritual life he lived. The time he spent in private prayer amounted to many hours daily. When I return home, he said, and give myself to meditation, prayer, and fasting, my soul longs for mortification, self-denial, humility, and divorcement from all things of the world. I have nothing to do, he said, with earth, but only to labor in it honestly for God. I do not desire to live one minute for anything which earth can afford. After this high order did he pray, feeling somewhat of the sweetness of communion with God and the constraining force of his love, and how admirably it captivates the soul and makes all the desires and affections to center in God. I set apart this day for secret fasting and prayer. To entreat God to direct and bless me with regard to the great work which I have in view of preaching the gospel, and that the Lord would return to me and show me the light of his countenance. I had little life and power in the forenoon. Near the middle of the afternoon God enabled me to wrestle ardently in intercession for my absent friends, but just at night the Lord visited me marvelously in prayer. I think my soul was never in such agony before. I felt no restraint, for the treasures of divine grace were open to me. I wrestled for absent friends, for the ingathering of souls, for multitudes of poor souls, and for many that I thought were the children of God, personally, in many distant places. I was in such agony from sun half an hour high 
till near dark that I was all over wet with sweat, but yet it seemed to me I had done nothing. O oh, my dear Savior, did sweat blood for poor souls. I longed for more compassion toward them. I felt still in a sweet frame, under a sense of divine love and grace, and went to bed in such a frame, with my heart set on God. It was prayer which gave to his life and ministry their marvelous power. Now, it wasn't too long after this entry that he had succumbed to the uh, latter stages of tuberculosis, wherein Jonathan Edwards uh, had taken him into his own home, where he spent the last of his life there. Now, interestingly enough, Jonathan Edwards' 17-year-old daughter, uh, some say, some mistake uh, David Brainerd as the son-in-law of Jonathan Edwards. They were never married. There was never a relationship there. But certainly, given more time on this earth, should David Brainerd have stayed, um, I think that, and most people think that there was a developing, budding, romantic, uh, I think she was in love with him, and he had feelings for her, and uh, but his his thoughts were all on God at this point in his life. I think they probably would have gotten married, but they didn't. In fact, sadly enough, after two months of of uh, David Brainerd's uh, death, uh, the daughter of Jonathan Edwards also died, and uh, they're in heaven together. And only the Lord knows what would have been uh, in that relationship. It would have been a match made in heaven for sure. Um, uh, anyway, David Brainerd, uh, he did so much in his short 29-year life that had impacted even uh, Jim Elliott and uh, William Carey. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I I wanted to say, you know, at the, the last of that excerpt, it talked about the the power of prayer. And I hope that if you're in ministry, that, that you're a praying person. Otherwise, uh, there won't be any lasting fruit. There, there's nothing about us that will ever last. It must be him. Anyway, folks, I hope you've enjoyed some of these stories. I've got a lot of stories to tell you about David Brainerd. He's one of my uh, heroes of the faith, and uh, and I hope he becomes one of yours too. I encourage you, read up on David Brainerd. If you get a chance to come across his um, biography, please read it, and uh, you'll be blessed because of it. Thank you for listening. Thanks for uh, uh, this time. See ya.